With one month still to go, what a year it's been for global economies with the focus really on slowing growth and uncertainty around the road ahead. It's really been a volatile time. Volatility has been the name of the game and investing in these uh, turbulent times has certainly been tricky business. But according to the International Monetary Fund, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies this year are in Africa. And that really underlining some of the potential that the African continent boasts for investors. But to what extent are we seeing a changing perception when it comes to risk versus opportunity? Well, to help me find out, we've got an esteemed panel of guests joining us uh, today. We've got Michael Andrew, who's chairman of KPMG International, Maria Ramos, CEO of ABSA and chief executive of Barclays Africa, Professor Nick Ben who's a founding director of the Gordon Institute of Business Science. And then joining us from our studios in Lagos, Nigeria as well, is Tonya Cole. He's the CEO of the Sahara Group. Let's get straight into some discussion. Thank you and welcome to you all. Michael, let's get uh, into things with you, because looking at the theme of today's event, it's all very poetic talking about the great Africa business migration. To what extent is Africa's potential really being realized? And is there, in fact, a changing perception when it comes to reality and investment risk versus opportunity? I think there's two parts to that, Alicia. First of all, I think people see the potential in Africa. Um, and therefore the issue about a rising aspirational middle class, um, improving domestic economy and resource security are really causing uh, global investors and global companies to look for growth opportunities. And Africa ticks most of those boxes. The challenge is the reality is that there are still a lot of questions to be asked around uh, infrastructure, um, around uh, energy uh, resourcing, uh, the quality of management here. So there's still a lot to be done to realise that opportunity but I think this is sort of that window of opportunity for Africa that exists. And we see that because when we talk, Maria, of risk aversion being back on, it's uh, emerging markets, frontier markets that get knocked back and they all get lumped into this risky asset basket. So how would you describe Africa's economic landscape and the investment potential it boasts? Well, I think Michael has highlighted the, 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 two, the two sets of issues. But I think it's also quite, uh, quite important to remind ourselves that even through the last crisis you know, that, that we've just gone through, and in fact that we're not quite out of yet, Africa's come through it not unscathed, because we've obviously felt the, the consequences of it, but we've come through it relatively well. I think the challenges are the issues Michael has referred to, the, the need to invest in infrastructure, the need to invest in, in education, because I think it's that investment in human capital that's going to be really, really important. And the need to continue to make sure that we have the sound fiscal and monetary policies that have got Africa to this point. And, and when we say Africa, we must also realize that this is a big continent with many, many different countries in it, all of them really quite different. And doing business in, in the countries in Africa differs from country to country. So you mentioned seven of the fastest growing economies in the, in the world are on this continent, and I think that's true. Doing business in each of those economies is very, very different. So I think it's the realization that this is a big continent, very different countries, different sta stages of development in each of those countries, and keeping really, really focused on understanding the risk and opportunity in each of those economies and not making assumptions about just saying, well, this is Africa, it's easy in each country that we do business in. Absolutely. It isn't. Well, Nick, you know, most economies in sub-Saharan Africa have experienced the crisis mildly. Does it indicate, you know, fundamentally sound capital markets in Africa, a preference for domestic and regional uh, investment or overall insularity? from the global markets? Well, I think it, it varies very much depending on, on where you, which type of economy you're looking at. We have resource economies that have really been fired up in recent years, Nigeria, Ghana to be, Angola, etc., that are being driven by the demand for energy and, and other mineral resources like the DRC. You have some smaller economies that are starting off from quite a slow base, so they're doing what, uh, what's being referred to. You have a growing middle class. And there is a lag. I, I, think, I don't think we follow the sort of instantaneous response 
to, to the downturn that other economies had. So maybe that's partly protected us. And, and I think we're starting off from a small base also with a much more positive climate. So I think those things tell us that the growth rates have been reasonable the last few years. Tonya, let's bring you into the conversation at this point. I mean, as Maria highlighted, there's strong distinctions to be made between, uh, you know, the various economies on the continent, uh, you know, and Africa as a, a global business destination of choice in that Africa is not a country like Brazil, like China, like India. It's a continent. We're dealing with a myriad of operating environments and uh, each with their own set of rules as well. From your experience across borders, just how complex an investment scenario are we looking at? Uh, <clears throat> like Maria said, I agree with her that we're dealing with some very, very complex issues. But when we go back to time, we find that those, complexi those complexity uh, complexities came about as a, re as a reason of borders that were created. Now, uh, back in history, Africa used to trade one with the other, and we have very similar cultures, even though we look like different countries. And I think one of the things that we have to do moving forward is the breaking down of these mental borders, because the borders seem to be a problem. I travel across Africa, and I find that, as an African, it's much more difficult for me, as an African, getting into fellow African countries or doing business in Africa than if I had a European passport or an American passport. We have to break those borders down, and it's very important that this is done. As an African businessman, what's your reading of the opportunity that's being presented here, and uh, you know, what's the appeal in the face of the complexities that we face? Okay. Now, I see I've never, I've never come across a better time to do business than now in Africa. But I've also found out that it's also extremely difficult for Africans doing business outside of their, of their individual countries. Now, as a, for Sahara, the company that I work with, we, we, carry a, we do business in different African countries. But we found that one of the things that, one of the hurdles that we have to overcome, the first hurdle we must overcome is that we're Africans. And I think that is really, really sad because we come with a lot of expertise, we come with a lot of aggression, we come with a belief that we can do anything and we can overcome any, any barriers that, that we find. But the barriers are mental, the barriers are instilled in us from the countries that we have to work in. And these are barriers that must be broken down. We have to lift those barriers. Yeah. Well, Maria, earlier this year, I looked at FDI trends. And between 1998 and 2008, FDI in Africa quadrupled. And, uh, you know, uh, in the last roughly two years, things have tapered down, but certainly not to the extent that many had anticipated. We've had Walmart, Coca-Cola, IBM, all of these international companies, Bati as well, making investment on the continent. And that's accelerating some of the diversification that these economic bases need. Is diversification of Africa's economic base happening fast enough in your books? Well, you know, I, I suppose it's, it never happens as, as fast as you want it to happen. I think it's very, I think FDI is exceedingly important. Mm -hmm. But, and, and as important as it is, I don't think it, it ever takes away the, 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 the importance of, of domestic investment because, you know, foreign Foreign investors invest, uh, but they, they're also going to invest when they see local people investing in their own economies. I think that, 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 that's just something that we sometimes forget about. If you're investing in your own economy, I think it's much easier and much more attractive for foreign investors to come in and invest, invest in the economy. And I think, uh, I think the point about about us as Africans investing in, in our own region is, is fundamentally important. And I, I, I agree entirely with the point that there are just too many barriers uh, to entry to in, 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 in between countries yeah. on this continent. The interregional trade is one of the greatest opportunities that we have, and yet there are just, there's just far too much red tape. And, I, I, I've been involved in, in discussions over many, many decades now about, you know, how we're going to break this down, how, you know, in, in SADC, the AU, 
uh, and all of the other formations in, t in, in, in terms of uh, you know, the organizations we have on the continent. And we just somehow are just far too slow in actually implementing the policies and decisions that we take to bring down those, trade, uh, yeah. the, those, the, those barriers. So yes, FDI is fun fundamentally important. It's, it's great and we should have much more of it. But let's not lose sight of domestic investment and not, let's not lose sight of inter-regional inter investment. Michael, with that investment. focus on breaking down borders and making it easier to do business on the continent, I mean, how much more of a drawcard are markets that have been creating regional blocks and you know, undergoing regional integration efforts? We've had this year the East African Common Market Protocol having been signed, and that really putting East Africa on the map as a, reg uh, an, a regionally integrated entity. Alicia, I think it's very important. Um, and I actually, it's interesting just reflecting on the comments of other panellists, because I think with FDI, I'm seeing sort of three phases. It, it's a lot lost on us at the moment that a lot of the FDI is coming from China and India, uh, which are both developing nations themselves. And when you think about it, there's a lot of common. They, they feel that Africa is actually very similar to their sort of uh, business environment. Highly decentralised, um, uh, uh, very large populations, relatively low uh, income levels. So the products that work in those markets actually work well in Africa. So they're seeing this as a window of opportunity. I think if you want to go to the next stage and really start to attract what I call the Western investors who will look at the continent on a pan-African basis, they themselves will not be interested in domestic countries. They'll be interested in zones. And the economic zones that you refer to, whether it be East Africa, whether it be Nigeria, whether it be Central South Africa, that's the way they'll run their business, not country by country. So if you can break down the borders and make that trade zone uh, more accessible, then the more likely you are to attract capital. And it's, the other thing I think I'd mention to you is you talk about the East African trade block. I mean, the reality is Doha is dead and the world is now looking at how to open up new trade uh, zones. So whether it's the Trans-Pacific Trade Zone, whether it's new ASEAN Trade Zone in 2015, it's very important that Africa respond to these movements because you're competing for, for investment. You're, you're competing for multinational companies to, to prioritise your marketplace. And you have to be conscious that the trend around the world is to create larger trade, zone, trade zones that facilitate interregional trade. And you have to respond and be competitive in that environment. Nick, let's hone in on doing business in Africa. And I know I'm using a very umbrella term at this stage. But uh, you know the associated themes that come with doing business in Africa uh, often is headlined by political risk. I mean, this year we've had political issues in Cote d'Ivoire, in Tunisia, um, Egypt, Kenya and Zimbabwe as well with their coalition governments uh, coming to the fore. In South Africa, there's a perception of a nuanced shift in economic policy as well. And it all begs the question, where are we headed in terms of sustainable economic policy? In your opinion, how does an investor actually go about assessing these political scenarios? And to what extent is it sculling a positive picture? I think the investor has got to look at every market differently. And the fact that you have a low income level does not mean your politics or your economy is not very complex. So that's one of the challenges that Europe's had in the last 50 years, is you have different systems, different mindsets. So you have to analyze each country for what it is. The middle class plays such a critical role and business leadership plays such an important role. Mm -hmm. If this is an exciting time, as some have mentioned, and I believe it is, then we have to have a dialogue in countries and in regions and perhaps a bit across the continent, although I believe more in the regional and local dynamics uh, than that. But the core is how do we come together and see the size of the opportunity and not miss it again? And what encourages me, I think, is, is the rise of the middle class in many, many countries like Nigeria, like Ghana, like Kenya, uh, and of course in South Africa, we have a large middle class that needs to really engage in civil society and government to bring us towards a less regulated, less bureaucratic, more market-based economy. And then, referring back to our guest from Lagos, we will see the creative capacities in the continent. Yeah, certainly, Tonya, when it comes to Nigeria, we've seen some economic reform underway on that end. The banking sector reforms have stolen much of the spotlight, but more in your arena, we've seen the petroleum industry bill also, uh, you know, causing quite a stir. Generally speaking, how are, gen uh, are regulatory frameworks impacting a business like yours, and is change happening fast enough, or has your expansion moved beyond or faster than that curve? No. Um now, we need regulations to move us forward, that's true. 
But one of the things that we find here in Nigeria and also across Africa is that the time it takes to move regulations forward, put policies in place, and then implement those policies are just astronomically too long. Now, the petroleum industry bill, taking that as an example, is, has been ongoing now for close to four years. And it's just brought the entire industry to a standstill. Now, that has got, that has got to stop. Something has got to be done to make people uh, be confident to invest. Now, each time you have laws and policies that take this long to implement, it causes bigger problems on FDIs, bigger problems for even local investors putting their money forward. Now, I think across board that one of the things that we lack in Africa is a strong political will to implement the policies that we put in place. We have policies and policies. Over, we are over-policized. But one of the things that we don't have is that strong political will that allows you to implement things and implement them quickly. And it's a problem. Yep, but it's certainly a long road ahead that we're looking forward to, uh, Maria. I mean, identifying risk is one thing. You've also got to anticipate in this context just as much, specifically with regards to changes in judicial and regulatory frameworks. Is this becoming easier to do as the African terrain gets a little bit better understood? You know, I, I, I think what we, what we have now is a, a greater focus on Africa. So. I think that that makes the conversation a lot easier. Uh, but we must also be conscious of the fact that the regulatory environment, uh, certainly in the, the sector I come from, in the banking sector, the regulatory environment is getting more and more, more complex. So I don't, uh, I'm not anticipating the, the future to become any easier. Uh, so no, I think it's an ongoing conversation, it's an ongoing engagement, it's, uh, it's making things more visible, but it's also an engagement between, between business and, and government and regulators. It's, uh, it's making sure that those conversations are about understanding the fact that once you make policy, the time between making policy, making laws and in the implementation of those is important, otherwise you have the kind of paralysis uh, that, uh, that uh, we've just heard about. And, and paralysis is not, is not good for, it's not good for business, it's not good for growth, and, uh, and it's not good for job, and the outcome of it is, is obviously not good for job creation, and one of the biggest challenges we face on this continent is also job creation. So, no, I think, I think the, it's, it's about making sure we make all of those things visible. Well, Michael, we're at a stage now where we've got capital flows outstripping that of aid. At the same time, we know that many African governments out there still depend on aid. I mean, for up to as much as 50% of their budgets right now. How do you break that cycle so that investment flows replace aid as an economic booster? Well, I think you've got to open up your markets and, and basically uh, allow business to be able to introduce the business models that have been successful overseas into those domestic markets. And that means giving them a degree of certainty about the long-term investment environment, making sure there's adequate infrastructure available, uh, which is an important role of governments to facilitate, uh, to make sure there's energy security and power security. Um, and really, I think, just to basically look at the regulation and, and say, uh, what is the cost-benefit of actually having these in place. So it, it's a delicate balance that all governments face. But we should also make the point, you know, we can be self-critical and we should actually um, learn the lessons elsewhere. But um, the same conversations are being had in doing business in India and in China and in South America. These countries are actually not easy uh, to also be successful with multinationals. So it's the, it's the relative ability, uh, I think, of African countries to understand the business dynamic and create that competitive advantage compared to their competition, which is really important, not creating the perfect system. Absolutely. Well, we'll be opening up that conversation to just how we get ourselves to be more competitive within that global context a little later. At this point, we'd like to open up the discussion to the audience. If you've got any question for uh, members of the panel, please feel free to ask. Uh, just uh, indicate by raising your hand, and we've got a roving microphone that will find its way to you. Uh, please indicate where you're from and who you're directing your question to as well. Any questions from the audience? Hi, I'm Frank Blackmore from KPMG. I think 
uh, one of the challenges we have to face is that we have these m many small, relatively small countries uh, as part of the African continent. And I think one of the needs we also have going forward is sort of an African Union type approach to a lot of these issues, whether it be a regulatory or, or legal or a trade court or whatever. We, w a lot of countries in Africa are battling from a skills shortage as well as a resource shortage in many areas. And for each of these countries to have their own um, sort of uh, legal structures and systems, uh, that may take many years to develop. And I think that's a great enabler for uh, inter-regional trade specifically, which I think also, I agree with the panel, is a vital uh, catalyst to growth with the, within our continent. I'll also, uh, another comment was, we mustn't forget about the West. Currently, FDI to Africa more than 40% comes from Europe. Uh, I think only 18% currently is from Asia. And so, although we're moving our trade patterns eastwards, we must also take cognizance of the investment we are receiving from, from Europe uh, in particular. Yep. Okay, so that's more comment uh, than anything else and agreeing uh, for the most part with the, uh, with the panel and I guess regional integration really needs to be uh, top of the agenda at this stage. Any other questions from the audience? Alicia, can I, can I just pick up on that before the mm -hmm. next question comes, which is, so what's the highest level of business council in Africa? Because I, I'm somewhat dubious given where we've gone the last 10 years about the AU, about the NEPAD initiative. And if we want to make market-based economies, and we believe it's in the interests of the citizens of these countries to do so, what's the highest level of coordination that we as a business community, multinationals and domestic companies, are coming together to argue and put forward with government sensible plans? So I just want to build on that point. Uh, I think it's critical we do that. The, the real issue is government to some extent of freeing up, as, as our guests in Lagos said. And I wonder whether we're putting enough effort into that. Okay, well, that's certainly something that we are going to be exploring. Michael, are we putting enough uh, effort into that? <laughs> uh, I suspect the answer is no. Um, you know, when I look at... I, I lived in Europe at the time when the market opened up and really it was a business-driven initiative to basically eliminate the customs duty, the barriers to entry uh, that were there and the efficiencies and synergies created were enormous. And I think that was the European Union at its best. Um, since then... Obviously, other issues have occurred through the interaction of the social chapter, which I think have now sort of played out and caused them some problems. But initially, the concept of basically creating an economic zone across those markets was a brilliant idea. We're now seeing that in ASEAN, you know, 780 million people now within the one marketplace. And if you link that into China and the United States and Australia, then you're talking 1.5 billion people. So business, I think, has an important role to play in just, I suppose, educating governments as to what is happening on a global basis uh, and what are the necessary parameters and criteria to continue to attract FDI into these markets. Absolutely. We've got another question from the audience. Hi, uh, my name is Thierry from the Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to find out what's the banking sector doing on a poor country like my country, the DRC, whereby the entrepreneur cannot um, compete with the FDI. And we know that um, in every country for its growth the local entrepreneur also need to contribute on uh, on the economy but uh, most of the part of the country the, the africa we saw that um I mean, we can see that uh, the fdi is more dominant than the, the local um, contribution what can africa do especially south africa is the biggest economy in africa maria so i wasn't i didn't quite get the i didn't quite get the question but if i and if I, if I get it wrong, I think you're asking what, what is the banking sector doing in terms of FDI? At the moment, we've got FDI that's yeah. uh, competing very aggressively with local entrepreneurs setting up shop on the continent. And one of the biggest hindrances, I think, to entrepreneurs setting up shop is access to credit, uh, credit lines as well. Uh, you know, is enough progress being uh, done on that front? I think, in terms of alleviating some of the tightness of those credit lines so that we get local investors putting back into the economy? Yeah. Well, I, I think there, there, there are two, set, two sets of questions. I mean, one, one, of course, is, you know, we all want, we all talk about FDI and making our markets more competitive to attract FDI, and I think we need to keep focused on that. I think the other is, how do you, how do you open up your markets? How do you develop 
uh, in markets, and I think you said you're from the DRC. How do you develop in markets and local markets so that you have a, a, an appropriate banking sector, one that is better able to, uh, to provide credit and to allow small and medium-sized enterprises and, and just generally the, the economy to function better and to have access to credit? And that's a function of how the, how the, the economy develops, how the banking sector develops. I know that in our own country, certainly the banking sector here yeah, is, is under, you know, con it's a very competitive banking sector. So we all go, we all want to, to make sure that, that we have both the product, the ca capability and the ability. And if we don't, our own regulators and government are constantly pushing us to make, uh, to make sure that we are providing credit to small and medium sized enterprise. So it's, it's a function of, of, of all of that. It's making sure that the, the regulatory environment allows you to do it, that, uh, that, you know, that the, the market is able to develop, and that you have the, the instruments, the products, and uh, the environment that allows for the banking sector to develop as well. So it's a combination of things. I think banks, banks generally would like to provide more credit. And along, alongside that, there's also a regulatory environment that makes life a little bit more difficult as we go along.